The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so what we are doing is uh, covering A334, which is uh, statistical physics. And let me remind you that uh, basically statistical physics is a bridge from microscopic to macroscopic perspectives. And I'm going to emphasize a lot on changing perspectives. Uh, so at the level of the micro, you have the microstate that is characterized maybe by a collection of momenta and coordinates of particles, such as particles of gas in this room. Maybe those particles have spins. If you are uh, absorbing things on a surface, you may have variables that denote the occupation, whether a particular site is occupied or not. And when you are looking at the microscopic world, typically you are interested in how things change as a function of time. You have a kind of dynamics that is governed by some kind of a Hamiltonian, which is dependent on the microstate that you are looking at and tells you about the evolution of the microstate. At the other extreme, you look at the world around you and the macro world, you are dealing with things that are described by completely different things. For example, if you are thinking about the gas, you have the pressure, you have the volume. So somehow the coordinates managed uh, to define a macro state, which is characterized by a few parameters in equilibrium. If you have uh, something like a collection of spins, maybe you will have a magnetization. And again, another important thing that characterizes the equilibrium we describe is temperature. And when you are looking at things from the perspective of uh, macro systems in equilibrium, then you have the laws of thermodynamics that govern constraints that are placed on these variables. So totally different perspectives. And what we have is that we need to build a bridge going from one to the other. And this bridge is provided by statistical mechanics. And the way that we uh, described it in the uh, previous course is that uh, what you need is a probabilistic prescription. So rather than following the time evolution of all of these degrees of freedom, you have a probability assigned to the different microstates that are dependent on the macrostate. And for example, if you are dealing in the canonical ensemble where you know you are at a particular temperature, this form has e to the minus beta, this Hamiltonian that we had here governing the dynamics. Uh, beta was 1 over kT, so I could write it in this fashion. And the thing that enabled us to make a connection between this deterministic perspective and this uh, equilibrium description via probabilities was uh, relying on the limit where the number of degrees of freedom was very large, and this very large number of degrees of freedom enabled us to, although we had something that was probabilistic, to really make very precise statements about what was happening. Now, when we were doing this program in A333, we looked at very simple systems that were essentially non-interacting, like the ideal gas or we put a little bit of uh, weak perturbation and 
by some manipulations, we got things like liquids. But the important thing is that whereas this program we could carry out precisely when we had no interactions, in the presence of interactions, we encountered, even in our simplified perspective, new things. We went from the gas state to a liquid state. We didn't discuss it, but we certainly said a few things about solids. And clearly, there are much more interesting things that can happen when you have interactions. You could have other phases of matter that we didn't discuss, such as liquid crystals, superconductors, and many, many other things. So the key idea is that you can solve things that are non-interacting going their own ways. But when you put interactions, you get interesting collective behaviors. And what we want to do in 8334, as opposed to just building the machinery in 8333, is to think about all of the different types of collective behavior that are possible and how to describe them uh, in the realm of uh, uh, classical systems. So we won't go much into the realm of quantum systems, which is also quite interesting as far as its own collective behavior is concerned. So that's the program. So now what I would like to do is to go to the description of the organization of the class. And hopefully this web page will come back online. All right. So repeating what I was saying before, the idea is that interactions give rise to a variety of uh, interesting collective behaviors, starting from pretty much simple degrees of freedom, such as atoms and molecules, and adding a little bit of uh, interactions and complexity to them, you could get uh, a variety of, for example, liquid crystal phases. But one of the things to think about is that you think about all of the different atoms and molecules that you can put together, and the different interactions that you could put among them. You could even imagine things that you construct in the lab that didn't exist in nature. And you put them together. But the types of uh, uh, new behavior that you encounter is not that much. At some level, you sort of learn about the three phases of matter, gas, liquids, solids. Of course, as I said, there are many more. But there are not hundreds of them. There are just a few. So the question is, why? given the complexity of the interactions that you can have at the microscopic scale. You put things together, and you really don't get that many uh, variety of things at the macroscopic level. And the answer has to do with kind of mathematical consistency, and has at its heart something that we already saw in A333, which is the central limit theorem. You take many random variables of whatever ilk, and you add them together, and the sum has a nice, simple Gaussian distribution. So somehow, mathematics forces things to become simplified when you put many of them together. So the same thing is happening when you put lots of interacting pieces together. New collective behaviors emerge. But because of the simplifications, in the same sense, the type of simplification that we see with the central limit theorem, there aren't that many consistent mathematical descriptions uh, that can emerge. Of course, there are nice new ones. Uh, and the question is how to describe them. So this issue of what are possible consistent mathematical forms is what we will uh, address through constructing these statistical field theories. So one of the important 
things that I will uh, try to uh, impose upon you is to kind of change your perspective in the same way that there is a big change of perspective thinking about the microscopic and the macroscopic world, there is also a change of perspective involved in the idea of uh, starting from interacting degrees of freedom and changing perspective and constructing a statistical field theory. And I'll give you one example of that today that you are hopefully all familiar with, but it shows very much how this change of perspective works, and that's the kind of methodology that we will apply in this course. And basically, uh, the syllabus is as follows. So uh, initially, I will try to uh, emphasize to you how, by looking at things, by averaging over many uh, degrees of freedom at long length scales and time scales, you get simplified statistical field theory descriptions. The simplest one of these that occurs in many different contexts is this Landau Ginzburg model that will occupy us for uh, quite a few lectures. Now, once you construct a description, one of these statistical field theories, the question is how do you solve it? And uh, there are a number of approaches that we will uh, follow, such as mean field theory, etc. And what we will find is that uh, those descriptions fail in certain dimensions. And then to do better than that, you have to rely on things such as perturbation theory. So this is kind of perturbation theory that builds upon the types of perturbation theory that we did in the previous semester, but is closer to the kind of perturbation theory that you would be doing in quantum field theories. Uh, alongside these continuum theories, I will also develop some lattice models that in certain limits are simpler and uh, uh, admit either numerical approaches or exact solutions. Uh, the key idea that uh, we will try to learn about is that of uh, uh, Kadanov's perspective of renormalization group and how you can, in some sense, change your perspective continuously by looking at how a system would look over larger and larger length scale and how the mathematical description that you have for the system changes as a function of the scale of observation and hopefully becomes simple at uh, sufficiently large scales. So uh, we will conclude by looking at a variety of applications of the methodologies that we have developed, for example, in the context of two-dimensional films, and uh, potentially, if we have time, a number of uh, other systems. The first thing that I'm going, the rest of the lecture today has essentially nothing in common with the material that we will start to cover as of the second lecture. But it illustrates this change in perspective that is uh, essential to the way of thinking about the material in this course. And the context that I will use to introduce this perspective is phonons and elasticity. So you look around you, there's a whole bunch of different uh, solids. There's metals, there's wood, etc. And for each one of them, we can ask things about their uh, thermodynamic properties, heat content, etc. For example, heat capacity. They are constructed of various, very different materials. And so let's try to think if we are going to start from this left side, from the microscopic perspective, how we would approach the problem of the heat content of these solids. So you would say that solids, if I were to go to zero temperature before I put any heat into them, they would be perfect crystals. 
what does that mean? It means that uh, if I look at the positions of these uh, atoms or particles that are making up the crystal, I guess I have to be more specific since, say, uh, metal is composed of uh, nuclei and electrons. Let's imagine that we look at the positions of the ions. Then in the perfect uh, position, they will form a lattice where I will pick three integers, L, M, N, and uh, three unit vectors. And I can uh, list the positions of all of these uh, uh, ions in the crystal. So this uh, combination of L, M, N that indicates the location of some particular uh, ion in the perfect solid that's indicated by, let's say, the vector R. So this is the position that I would have ideally for the ion at zero temperature that is labeled by R. Now, of course, when we go to finite temperatures, the particles rather than forming this nice lattice, let's imagine a square lattice in two dimension, uh, starts to move around. And uh, they are no longer going to be perfect positions. And these distortions, we can indicate by uh, some vector u. So when we have perfect crystals cross deformations, this Q star changes to a new position, Q of R, which is its ideal position, plus a distortion field U at each location. Okay. Now, associated with these change of positions, you have moved away from the lowest energy configuration, you have put energy in the system. And uh, you would say that the energy of the system is going to be composed of the following parts. There's always going to be some kind of a kinetic energy. That's sum over r, p uh, r squared over 2m. Let's imagine these particles all have the same mass m. And Then the reason that these particles formed this perfect crystal was presumably because of the overlap of uh, electronic wave functions, etc. Eventually, if we are looking at these coordinates, there is some kind of a many body potential as a function of the positions of all of these particles. Okay. Now, what we are doing is we are looking at distortions that are small. So let's imagine that we haven't gone to such high temperatures where this crystal completely melts and disappears and gives us something else. But we have small changes from what we had at zero temperature. So presumably, the crystal corresponds to the configuration that gives us the minimum energy. And then if I make a distortion and expand this potential in the distortion field, the lowest order term proportional to various u's will disappear because I'm expanding around the minimum. And the first thing that I will get is from the second order term. So I have 1 half sum over the different positions I have to do the second derivative of the potential with respect to these deformations. Of course, if I'm in three dimensions, I also have three spatial indices, x, y, and z. So I would have to take derivatives with respect to uh, the different coordinates, alpha and beta, and summed over them. And then I have u alpha of r u beta of r prime. And then, of course, I will have higher order terms in this expansion. This is a general potential. So then the higher order terms will be order of u cubed and higher. Okay. 
fine. So I have a system of this form. Now, typically, the next stage, if I stop at the quadratic level, this I would do for a molecule also, not only for a solid, is to try to find the normal modes of the system. Normal modes I have to obtain by diagonalizing uh, this uh, matrix of second derivatives. Now, there are a few things that I know that help me. And one of the things that I know is that because the original structure was a perfect uh, solid, let's say, then let's, there will be a matrix, sorry, there will be an element of this second derivative that corresponds to that R and this R prime. That's going to be the same as the second derivative that connects these two points, because this pair of points is obtained by the first pair of points by simple translation along the lattice. The environment for this is exactly the same as the environment for this. So essentially, what I'm stating is that this function does not depend on r and r prime separately, but only on the difference between r and r prime. So I know a lot. So this is not if I had n. Uh, atoms in my system, this is not something like n squared over two independent things. It is much lower number. The fact that I have such a lower number allows me to calculate the normal modes uh, of the system by Fourier transform. And I won't be very precise about how we perform Fourier transforms. Basically, I start with this k alpha beta, which is a function of separation. I can do a sum over all of these separations r of e to the i k dot r for appropriately chosen k. And summing over all pairs of differences, so, so the argument r here now is what was previously r minus r prime. So basically, what I can do is I can pick one point and go and look at all of the separations from that point, construct this object. This will give me a Fourier transformed object that depends on the wave number k. Okay. So if I look at the potential energy of the system minus uh, its value at zero temperature, which from one perspective was one half sum over r r prime alpha beta this k alpha beta r minus r prime u alpha of r, u beta of r prime in the quadratic approximation. If I do Fourier transforms, what happens, because it is only a function of r minus r prime and not r and r prime separately, is that in Fourier space, it separates out into a sum that depends only on individual k modes. There is no coupling between k and k prime. So here we had r and r prime. But by the time we get here, we just have 1k alpha and beta. We'll do one example of that in more detail later on. I have the Fourier transformed object. And then I have u alpha k Fourier transform, so in the same manner that I Fourier transform this kernel, k alpha beta, I can put here a u and end up here with a u tilde. And u tilde beta of k star. 
Okay. So we start over here, if you like. If I have n particles with the matrix that is n by n, actually 3n by 3n, if I account for the three different orientation. And by going to Fourier transforms, we have separated it out for each of n potential Fourier components. We just have a 3 by 3 matrix. Uh, so then we can potentially diagonalize this 3 by 3 matrix. to get its eigenvalues lambda alpha of k. Once I have the eigenvalues of the system, then I can find frequencies or eigenfrequencies omega alpha of k, which would be related to this lambda alpha of k divided by m. So you go through this entire process. The idea was you start with different solids. You want to know what the heat content of the solid is. You have to make various approximations to even think about the normal modes. You can see that you have to figure out what this kernel of the interaction is, Fourier transform it, diagonalize it, etc. And the ultimate thing that you are after is that there are these frequencies as a function of wave number. Actually, it's really a wave vector because there will be three different kx, ky, and kz. And at each one of these k values, you will have uh, three eigenfrequencies. And presumably, as you span k, you will have a whole bunch of lines that would correspond to the variations of these frequencies as a function of k. Why is that useful? Well, the reason that is useful is that as you go to high temperature, you put energies into these normal modes and frequencies. That's why this whole lattice is vibrating. And the amount of energy that you have put at temperature T on top of this V0 that you had at zero temperature up to constants of proportionality that I want, don't want to bother with is a sum over all of these normal modes that are characterized by k and alpha, the polarization and the wave vector. And the amount of energy then that you would put in one harmonic oscillator of frequency omega. And that is something that we know to be h bar omega alpha of k divided by e to the beta h bar omega alpha of k minus 1. Okay. So the temperature dependence then appears in this factor of beta over here. So the energy content went there. And if we want to, for example, ultimately calculate heat capacity, I have to calculate this whole quantity as a function of temperature and take it, then takes its derivative. So it seems like, OK, I have to do this for every single solid, whether it's copper, aluminum, uh, wood, or whatever. I, I have to figure out what these uh, frequencies are, what's the energy content in each frequency. And it seems like a, okay, a complicated engineering problem, if you like. Is there anything about this that transcends having to look at all of these details and uh, uh, come to this? And of course, you know the answer already, which is that if I go to sufficiently low temperature, I know that the heat capacity due to phonons for all solids goes like T cubed. So somehow, all of this complexity if I go to low enough temperature, disappears. And some universal law emerges that is completely independent 
of all of these details, microscopics, interactions, etc. So our task, this is the change of perspective, is to find a way to circumvent all of these things and get immediately to the heart of the matter, the part that is independent of the details. Not that the details are irrelevant, because after all, if you want to build some material that functions at some particular set of temperatures, you need to know much more than this T cube law that I'm telling you about. But maybe from the perspective of what I was saying before, how many independent forms there are in the same sense that adding up random variables always gives you a Gaussian. Of course, you don't know where the mean and the variance of the Gaussian is, but you are sure that it's a Gaussian form. So similarly, there is some universality in the knowledge that no matter how complicated the material is, its low temperature heat capacity is T cubed. Can we get that by a, an approach that circumvents the details? So I'm going to do that. But before, since I did a little bit of hand waving, to be more precise, let's do the one-dimensional example. In a little bit more detail. So my one-dimensional solid is going to be a bunch of uh, ions or molecules or whatever whose zero temperature positions is uh, uniformly separated by some lattice spacing A along one dimension. And if I look at uh, the formations, I'm going to indicate them by the one dimensional distortion UN of the nth one along this chain. So then I would say, OK, the potential energy of this system minus whatever it is at 0, just because of the distortion. I would write as follows. It is a sum over n. And uh, one thing that I can do is to say that if I look at two of these things that are originally at distance a, and then they go and deform by un and un plus 1, the additional deformation from a is actually un plus 1 minus un. So I can put some kind of a Hookian elasticity and write it in this fashion. Now, of course, there could be an interaction that goes to second neighbors. So I can write that as k2 over 2 un plus 2 minus un squared and further neighbors and so forth. I can add as many as these as I, can li as I like to make it as general as possible. So in some sense, this is a kind of rewriting of the form that I had written over here, where these things that were a function of the separation, these k alpha beta of separation, are these k1, k2, k3, et cetera, in this series that you would write down. Now, if you go to Fourier space, so uh, what you can do is each uh, un of uh, uh, un, which is the distortion in the original perspective, you can fully transform. And write it as a sum over k e to the i k position of the n particle is n a times u tilde of k. And once you make this Fourier transform in the expression over here, you get an expression for v minus v0 in terms of the Fourier modes. So rather than having an expression in terms of the amplitude u sub n, after Fourier transform, I will have an expression in terms of u tilde of k. So let's see what that is. Forget about various proportionality. I have the sum over n. Each one of the un's, I can write in this fashion in terms of u tilde of k. Since this is a quadratic form, 
I need to have two of these, so I will have a sum of k and k prime. Uh, I have uh, uh, the factor of 1 half. Each un goes with a factor of e to the i n a k. But then I had two un. Like there is a term here if I do the expansion, which is un squared. So I will have one from k and one from k prime. Okay. And however, if I have un plus 1 minus un, what I have is e to the i k a minus 1. I already took the contribution that was e to the i n uh, k. From the second factor, I will get e to the i k prime a minus 1. This multiplies k1 over 2. And uh, then I will have something that's k2 over 2, e to the 2i ka minus 1, e to the 2i k prime a minus 1, and so forth, multiplying at the end of the day uh, u tilde of k, u tilde of k prime. Now, when I do the sum over n, and the only n dependence appears over here, then this is the thing that forces k and k prime to add up to 0. Because if they don't add up to 0, then I'm adding lots of random phases together, and the answer will be 0. So essentially, this sum will give me a delta function that forces k plus k prime to be 0. Okay? And so then the additional potential energy that you have because of the distortion ends up being proportional to 1 half sum over the different k's. Only 1k will remain because k prime is forced to be minus k. And so I will have u of k, u of minus k, which is the same thing as u of k. Uh, complex conjugate, so I will get that. And then from here, I will get k1. Now when k prime is set to minus k, and I multiply these two factors, I will get 1 plus 1 minus e to the i k a minus e to the minus i k a. So I will get 2 minus 2 cosine of k a. And then I will have k2. 2 minus cosine of 2ka, and so forth. Okay. I got the lights here not on. OK, it's still visible. So, yes? So, in your last line, you have the absolute value of u of k, but uh, in the line above it, is it u of k times u star of k prime, or how does that work? Uh, OK, so the way that I have written is each un I have written in terms of the tilde of k. And at this first stage, the two factors of un that I have here, I treat them completely equivalently with indices k and k prime. So there is no complex conjugation involved here. Okay. But when k prime is said to be minus k, then I additionally realize that if I Fourier transform here, I will find that u tilde of minus k is the same thing as u tilde of k star, because essentially the complex conjugation uh, appears over here. Okay? It's not 
that important point. The important point is that we now have an expression for our frequencies, our omega alpha of k. Actually, there is no polarization. It's just omega of k. Uh, are related to square root of something like a mass down here. Again, that's not particularly important. But something like k1, 2 minus 2 cosine of kA, uh, k2, 2 minus 2 cosine of uh, 2kA, and so forth. So I can plot these frequencies, omega, as a function of k. One thing to note is, first of all, the expression is clearly symmetric under k goes to minus k. It's only dependent on cosine of k. So it is sufficient to draw one side of it. The other side for negative k would be the opposite. The other thing to note is that, again, if I do this Fourier transformation and I have things that are spaced by A, effectively means that the shortest wavelengths that I have to deal with are of the order of A, which means that the wave numbers are also uh, kind of uh, uh, limited by something like pi over. I can't go beyond. So there's something that in the generalized case over here, you would call that your k vectors are within a Brillouin zone. In one dimension, the Brillouin zone is simply between uh, minus pi over a and pi over a. Now, the interesting thing to note is that as k goes to 0, the omega goes to 0. Because all of these factors, you can see as k goes to 0, vanish. And in particular, if I start expanding around k equals to 0, what I find is that all of these things are quadratic. They go like k squared. So when I take the square root, they will have an absolute value of k in them. So I know for sure that these omegas start linearly. What I don't know, since I have no idea what k1, k2, etc., are, are is what they do out here. So there could be some kind of a strange spaghetti or whatever going on over here. I have no idea. There's all kinds of complexity, but they are away from the k equals to 0 part. And again, why does it go to 0? Of course, k equals to 0 corresponds to taking the entire chain and translating it. And clearly, I constructed this such that if all of the u's are the same, I take everything and translate it, there is no energy cost. So there is no energy cost for k equals to 0. The energy cost for small k have to be small. By symmetry, they have to be quadratic in k. So I take the square root, and you will get a linear. Of course, you know that this linear part, we can say that omega is something like a sound velocity. So all of these chains, when I go to low enough uh, uh, k's or low enough frequencies, admit these sound light waves. Okay. Now heat content, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to take these frequencies, put them in the expression that I have over here, and calculate what's going on. So again, if I want to look at the entirety of everything that is going on here, I would need to know the details of k2, k3, k4, etc. And I don't know all of that. So you would say, OK, I haven't really found anything universal yet. But if I look at one of these functions and plot it as a function of the frequency, what do I see? When omega goes to 0, I can expand this. And what I get is kt. Essentially, it's the statement that low frequencies behave like classical oscillators. A classical oscillator has an energy kt. Once I get to a frequency that is of the order of kt over h bar, then because of the exponential, I kind of damp down to 0. Okay. 
So very approximately, I can imagine that this is a function that is kind of like a step. It is either 1 or 0. And the change from 1 to 0 occurs at a frequency that is related to temperatures by kT over h. So if I'm at some high temperature up here, and I want to, so this omega is kV t some high over h bar. That's the corresponding high frequency. I need to know all of these frequencies to know what's going on for the energy content. But if I go to lower and lower temperatures, eventually I will get to low enough temperatures where the only thing that I will see is this linear portion. And I'm guaranteed that I will see that. I know that I will see that eventually. And therefore, I know that eventually, if I go to low enough temperatures, the excitation energy becomes low enough is simply proportional to this integral from 0. Uh, I can change the upper cut of the infinity if I like. dk h bar dk divided by e to the beta h bar dk uh, minus 1. And again, dimensionally, I have two factors of k here. Each k scales with kt. So I know that this whole thing is proportional to kt squared. In fact, there is some proportionality constants that depend on h bar b, etc. It doesn't matter. The point is this t squared behavior. So I know immediately that my heat capacity is proportional to derivative of this is going to be proportional to t, the heat capacity of a linear chain, independent of what you do. So no matter what the set of interactions is, if I start with a situation such as this at zero temperature, I know if I put energy into it at low enough temperature, I would get this heat capacity that is linear. I don't know how low I have to go to. Because how low I have to go to depends on what this velocity is, what the other complication is, etc. So that's the part that I don't know. I know for sure the functional form, but I don't know the amplitude of that functional form. OK? So the question is, can we somehow get this answer in a slightly different way without going through all of these things? And the idea is to do a coarse grain. So what's going on here? Why is it that I got this, this form? Well, the reason I got this form was I went to low enough temperature. At low enough temperature, I had only the possibility of exciting modes whose frequencies were small. I find that frequencies small correspond to wave numbers k that are small, or they correspond to wavelengths that are very large. Right? So essentially, if you have your solid, you go to low enough temperature, you will be exciting modes of some characteristic wavelength that are inversely proportional to temperature and become larger and larger. So eventually, these long wavelength modes will encompass whole bunches of uh, your atoms. So this lambda becomes much larger than the spacing of the particles in the chain that you were looking at. And what you are looking at, low temperature, is a collective behavior that encompasses lots of particles moving collectively and together. And again, because of some kind of averaging that is going on over here, 
you don't really care about the interactions among uh, small particles. So it's the same idea. It's the same large end limit appearing in a different context. It's not the end that becomes very large, but n that becomes of the order of, let's say, 100 lattice spacing is already much larger than an individual atom doing something. It is a collection of atoms that are moving together. So what I drew here was an example of a mode, but I can imagine that I have some kind of a distortion in my system. Now, I started with the distortions un that were defined at the level of each individual atom or uh, molecule or variable that I have over here. But I know that things that are next to each other are more or less moving together. So what I can do is I can average, I can sort of pick a distance, let's call it dx, and average all of those uns that are within that distance and find how that average is. And as I move my interval that I'm averaging, I'm constructing this corresponding function u of x. Okay? So there is a moving window along the chain constructed with a dx that is much larger than a, but is much less than this characteristic frequency. And using that, I can construct a distortion field. Now, I started with discrete variables, and I ended up with a continuous function. So this is an example of a statistical field. So this distortion appears to be defined continuously, but in fact, it has much less degrees of freedom, if you like, compared to all of the discrete variables that I started with, because this continuous function certainly does not have, when I fully transform it, variations at short length scales. So we are going to be constructing a lot of these uh, coarse-grained statistical uh, fields. Okay, if you think about the temperature in this room varying from one location to another location, pressure so that we construct sound waves, etc., all of these things are examples of a continuous field but clearly, that continuous field comes from averaging things that are, exist at the microscopic level. So it's kind of a, a counterintuitive that I start with discrete variables and I can replace them with some continuous function. But again, the emphasis is that this continuous function has a limited set of wavelengths or wave numbers over which it is defined. OK, so we are going to describe the system in terms of this. So the analog of this potential that we had over here is some v that is a functional of this u of x. And I want to construct that functional. And so the next step after you des decided what your statistical field is, is to construct some, some relevant things, such as an energy, potential energy that is re uh, appropriate to that uh, uh, statistical field, putting as limited amount of uh, uh, information as possible in construction of that. So what are the things that we are going to put in constructing this uh, functional? The first thing that I will do is I will assume that there is a kind of locality, by which I mean the following. That while this is in principle a function of the entire function, locality means that I will write it as an integral of some density. where the density at location x that I'm integrating depends on u at that location, but not just u, also including derivatives of u. And you can see that this is really a continuum version of what I have written here. 
this, if I go to the continuum, this goes like a derivative. And if I look at further and further distances, I can construct higher and higher derivatives. So in the sense that this is a quite general description, I can construct any kind of potential here by choosing interactions k1, k2, k3, k, k100 that go further and further apart, you would say that if I include sufficiently high derivatives here, I can also <coughs> include interactions that are uh, extending over far away distances. The idea of locality is that while we make this expansion, our hope is that at the end of the day, we can terminate this expansion without needing to go to many, many high orders. So that's locality is two parts. One, that you will write it in this form. And secondly, that this function will not depend on many, many high derivatives. Okay? The second part of it is uh, 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 symmetries. Now, one of the things that I constructed in here and ultimately was very relevant to the result that I had was that if I take a distortion u of x and I add a constant to everybody. So if I replace all of my uns to un plus phi, for example, the energy does not change. So v of this is the same thing as v of u of x. Okay? So that's a symmetry. Essentially, it's this translational symmetry that I was saying right here at the beginning, that this only depends on the separation of two points. It's the same thing. But what that means is that when you make your uh, you write your density functional, the density cannot depend on u of x because that would violate this. So you can only start with things that depend on the u by dx, this second, et cetera. And finally, uh, so this is one, this is two. Another thing is what I will call stability. That you are looking at distortions around a state that corresponds to being a, a stable configuration of your system. What that means is that you cannot have any terms in this expansion that are linear. So again, this was implicit in everything that we did over here. We went to second order, but there's third order, etc., are not ruled out. It is more than that because you require the second order terms to have the right sign so that your system corresponds to being at the bottom of a quadratic potential rather than the top of it. So there is a little bit more than the absence of linear terms. So given that, you would say that your potential or this system as a functional of this distortion is something like an integral over x. And the first thing that is consistent with everything that we have written so far is that it will be proportional to du by dx squared. So there's a coefficient that I can put here. Let's call it k over 2. It cannot depend on u. It has to be quadratic function of derivative. That's the first thing I can write down. I can certainly write down something like d2u by dx to the fourth power. And if I consider higher order terms, why not something like uh, the second derivative squared, first derivative squared, or a whole bunch of other terms. So again, there's still many, many, many terms that I can write down. Yes? Um, is that second term supposed to be a second derivative to the fourth power? Or? Yes. Thank you. So that when I Fourier transform this, okay, the quadratic part becomes a sum over k, k over 2. This Fourier transform becomes k squared. This Fourier transform, as you said, is second 
derivative squared, so it becomes k to the fourth. I have a whole bunch of terms. And then I have u of k tilde squared. And then I will have higher order terms from Fourier transform of this. Yes? Does this actually forbid like odd derivatives or saying like the third derivative and stuff? Don't I didn't go into that because that cons uh, depends on some additional considerations. Whether or not you have a mirror symmetry. If you have a mirror <coughs> symmetry, you cannot have terms that are odd in x. Whether or not you have some condition on u and minus u may or may not forbid third order terms in the u by dx. So at once I go beyond the quadratic level, I need to rely on some additional symmetry statement as to which additional terms I am allowed to write down. Yes? Also, the coefficients could depend on x, right? Uh, OK. So one of the things that I assumed was this uh, symmetry, which is that every position in the crystal is the same as any other position. So here, if I break and make the coefficient to be different from here to different from there, it amounts to the same thing, that the starting point uh, was, a, was not a crystal. Shouldn't that be written as, uh, in the place where you wrote down the symmetry, it should be u of x plus c, <coughs> like inside the parentheses? No. Equal to? No. no. So look at this. So if I take un and I replace un to un plus 5, so essentially I take the entire lattice and move it by a distance. Actually, 5 was probably not good. 5.14. It's not a dis anything I can put over here. Energy will not change. OK? Is that somehow, that must be different from adding to all the ends uh, a constant displacement? Uh, ends are labels of your variables. So I don't know what you mean by. Uh, yeah. But in that picture where instead of ends we have x, yes. it seems like displacing uh, in space would mean adding no. to x. No, it is this displacement. I take u1, u2, u3, u4. u1 becomes u1 plus 0.3. u2 becomes u2 plus 0.3. Everybody moves in step. So the conclusion is the coefficients don't depend on x? If you have a system that is uh, Uniform. So the statement here actually depends on uniformity. This is an additional thing. Uniform. So one part of the material is the same. Now you have non-uniform systems. So you take your crystal and you bombard it with neutrons or whatever. Then you have defects all over the place. Then one location will be different from another location. You are not able to write that anymore. So there's a uniformity is another symmetry that I kind of implicitly used. Um, yes? Uh, when you wrote uniform as a separate word, why isn't it implied by translational symmetry? Uh, what, what, what is it? If I take this material that I neutron bombarded and I translate it in space, its, ener its internal energy will not, still not change. Um, right? So, so again, once I come to this stage, uh, what it amounts to is that uh, I have constructed a kind of energy as a function of a deformation field. If I were to, uh, actually, let's just uh, as a function of a deformation field which in the limit of very long wavelengths has this very simple form, which is the integral du by dx squared. There are higher order terms, but hopefully in the limit of long wavelengths, the higher derivatives will disappear. In the limit of small deformation, the higher order terms will disappear. So the lowest order term at long wavelengths, et cetera, is parameterized by this 1k. 
If I Fourier transform it, I will just get k over 2 k squared. When I take the frequency that corresponds to that, I will get uh, that kind of behavior. So by kind of relying on these kinds of statements about symmetry, etc., I was able to guess that. Now let's go and do this for the case of a uh, material in uh, three dimensions. Actually, in any dimensions, in higher dimensions. So I take a solid in three dimensions, or maybe a film in two dimensions. I can still this, uh, this, uh, describe its uh, deformations at low enough temperature in terms of long wavelength modes. I do the coarse graining. I have a u of x. Actually, both u and x are now vectors. And what I want to do is to construct a potential that corresponds to this entity. Okay. So I will use the idea of locality, and I write it as an integral over however many dimensions I have. So d is the dimensionality of space of some kind of an energy density. And the energy density now will depend on u. Actually, u has many component, d components, u alpha of x derivatives of u, so I will have the u alpha by the x beta. And you can see that higher order derivatives, there will be more, more and more indices. So there's the complication now is that I have additional indices involved. The symmetry that I will use is a slightly more complicated version of what I had before. I will take the crystal u of x, and I can translate it just as I did before. And I will say that this translation of crystal will not change its energy. But you know something else. I can take my crystal, and I can rotate it. The internal energy should not change. So there is a rotation of this that also you can put the C inside or before or after the rotation, it doesn't matter. Uh, the energy should not uh, depend on that. OK. So let's see what we have to construct. I can write the answer. Well, first of all, we know if, uh, immediately that uh, the energy cannot depend on U itself for the same reason as before. It can depend on derivatives. But this rotation and derivatives is a little bit strange. So I'm going to use a trick. Uh, if I do this in Fourier space, like I did over here, I went from this to k over 2 integral dk k squared u tilde of k squared. If I stick with sufficiently low derivatives, only at the level of the second order derivatives, so if I have a second order form that depends on something like this, I can still go to Fourier space, and the answer will be of the form integral d dk. The different k modes will only get coupled from higher order terms, third order terms, etc. At the level of quadratic, I know that the answer is proportional to the decay. And for all of the reasons that we have been discussing so far, the answer is going to be u of k squared times some function of k, like k squared k to the fourth. Now, whatever I put over here has to be invariant under rotations. So let's see. I know that the answer that I write here should be quadratic in u tilde. It should be at least quadratic in k, 
because I'm looking at derivatives in the same way that I had k, k here, I should have uh, derivat uh, uh, factors of k here. But k is a vector when I go to three dimensions. u becomes a vector when I go to three dimensions. So I want to construct something that is involves quadratic in vector k, quadratic in vector u, and is also invariant under rotations. There's one uh, thing that I know is that if I do a dot product of two vectors, that dot product is invariant under rotation. So I have two vectors. So I know, therefore, that k squared k dot k is rotationally invariant. u uh, tilde of k squared is rotationally invariant. But also k dot u tilde of k squared is rotationally invariant. Okay, so what I can do is I can say that the most general form that I will write down will allow two terms. The coefficients of that are traditionally called mu. This is mu over 2. This one is called mu plus lambda over 2. Actually, I have to put an absolute value squared here. Okay. So that's the most general theory of elasticity in any number of dimensions that is uh, consistent with this symmetry that I have written. And it turns out that this corresponds to elasticity of materials that are isotropic. And they are described by two elastic coefficients, mu and lambda, that are called Lamé coefficient. Mu is also related to shear modulus. Actually, mu and lambda com combined are related to bulk modulus. And I can, if I want, in fact, fully transform this back to real space. And in real space, the energy can be written as mu over 2 u alpha beta of x, u alpha beta of x, where the sum over alpha and beta takes place. Alpha and beta run from 1 to d. And the other term, lambda over 2, is u alpha alpha of x, u beta beta of x. And this object, u alpha beta, is 1 half of the symmetrized derivatives, du alpha by dx beta plus du beta by dx alpha, and it's called the strength tensor. Yes? So are you still looking in the regime of uh, low energy excitations? Yes, that's right. So, so wouldn't the discreteness of the allowed wave vectors become important? And okay. if so, why are you integrating rather than discrete summing? Uh, OK. So let's go back to what you have over here. The discreteness is present over here. And what I am looking at for the discreteness, the spacing that I have between these objects is 2 pi over L, where L is the size of the system. So if you like. What we are looking at here is a hierarchy of length scales, where L is much larger than the typical wavelengths of these excitations that are set by the temperature, which is in turn much larger than the lattice space. And so when we are talking about a, uh, say, solid at around 100 degrees temperature or so, this. Uh, length scale over here typically spans 10 to 100 atoms, whereas the actual size of the system spans billions of atoms or more. And so the separations that are imposed by the discreteness of k are irrelevant to the considerations that we have. Yes? Uh, what about the um, so before with this, like adding a constant c, 
that corresponds to translating every, you know, almost the entire crystal by some vector. Right. Um, for the rotation, is this a rotation of the crystal or is this a rotation of the displacement field? It's the, the rotation of the entire crystal. So okay. you can see that essentially both X and U have to be rotated together. I didn't write it precisely enough, but when I wrote the invariant as being K dot U, the implicit thing was that the wave vector and the distortion are rotated together. So does it require an isotropic crystal in that case? Since yes. You're, I mean, I would think like, okay, if, if you're rotating everything together, who cares if one axis is different than another? Because if I have a non-isotropic crystal and I rotate it around, it shouldn't change the internal energy. Okay, where it will make difference is at higher order terms. And so then uh, I have to think about the invariants that are possible at the level of higher order terms, but that's a good question. Let me come back and try to answer that more carefully next time around.